Why, hello, you lovely Livy Lions. Welcome to another edition of the Almond Viewed Podcast with myself, Jake Pointer, my co-host, Liam Innes. Hello. And virgin lipped panellist, Thomas Fro, Owen Innes and Mr. Stephen Povey. Hello there. As per, we are brought to you in association with After Extra Time Shirts. So jump over to their Twitter page, that's at AET Shirts, and check out what they have to offer. This week, we're choosing a moment each from last week's defeat against Rangers and Livingston United, the Motherwell branch, as well as chatting all things West Lothian with Dr. Goals himself, Dr. Kenny Juca, as well as diving into his time at those border bobags Gretna. And finally, to celebrate International Women's Day that was on Monday the 8th of March, our resident ladies' man, Thomas Froh, will be telling us all about the Livingston women's team and their journey from Blackburn to macaroni heaven. So get those trotters of yours up, pour yourself a Baileys and ice, pop back the recliner and come on a journey of pain, misery and heartbreak as we chat all things Livingston FC here on the Am and View podcast. Another two games for the Lions in the past week, and boy oh boy how I've missed that losing feeling. Livingston put in a brave performance against those ravenous Broxy Bears, grr, Rangers, on Wednesday, but fell to a late 1-0 defeat at the Macarena. And all the good work they'd done against those Broxy Bears, grr, went out the window as the felines meowed surrender to the Fur Park fannies of Motherwell in a dismal 3-1 defeat at the hands of the men of steel. Povey, give us a moment from either of those games that had you whimpering like a lion that stubbed its big stupid toe. I'm sure one of us will talk about the Rangers game. I'm just going to jump right in with the Motherwell game. I'm going to start with a positive because I've been a money so-and-so recently. So uh, the one positive for me was seeing Poplatna get Um, 90 minutes, get the full game I thought he put himself out there, I thought he was good I thought he he had good moments and you know, for me I worry has been that Robbo is like the only choice we've obviously seen Tiffs come on uh, here and there but Mm -hmm. bear in mind, we're a top six side Uh, we're we're the fifth best side in the country, like on paper (laughs) I, I, yeah. That's the thing I keep during this horrible spell. I keep like telling myself that, like you know, we're the fifth best side in Scotland, and it, like I, I think it was frustrating as well, um, not getting anything from that game um, because how Aberdeen and and Hibs certainly Aberdeen are really really catchable in my opinion. Um, yeah. I just it's a frustrating spell and. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look like well, it doesn't look like it's going anywhere. We were away against Motherwell, who in the past, you know, it's not an easy place to go. I know they've not had a great season. We were poor, though. We've been poor. That Rangers performance, which I'm sure one of you will touch on, was was much better than what we've seen. But there's back to it on Motherwell against Motherwell, wasn't it? Leaking goals. Uh, yeah. I mean, as I say, I think, Owen, you, you were going to talk about the goalie situation, so I'll leave that to you. But for me, a positive is Poplatnik. I'd like to see a bit more of him going ahead. Um, I don't really know the Robbo situation. Uh, some, I heard a few funny things, but um, I'm I'm quite quite happy with seeing Poplatnik start. You know? Yeah. Owen, can you give us a moment from either the Rangers or the Motherville game, please? I think both games are really kind of a moment of their own. Uh, Two completely contrasting moments, though. Uh, From how badly we've been playing before the Rangers game within, you know, I was expecting a full-on tanking from Rangers, but we really, really limited them. Uh, we defended really, really well. I thought I thought Fitzwater was absolutely fantastic, just like he was earlier on uh, in the season. Like uh, during the nil nil game, I think he came in and performed really, really well. Um, Gavin Riley obviously going off injured is is a bit of a, an issue for us because we're we are despite the amount of 
bloody strikers that we've got. We're incredibly light up top, aren't we? Like, you know, we've got Riley, Paplatnik, Tiffany, Robbo, um, arguably uh, the Jet, and obviously Hamilton's away on loan and stuff, you know, so we've got five strikers. and Could also uh, put uh, Yez Kabaya in that category as well. Yeah, yeah, Yez Kabaya could probably play up front there. Uh, Alan Forrest even played up front for Air United for a lot of last season, the last, well, the last couple of seasons. Um, yeah, and, and we just can't seem to hit a barn door with a banjo at the moment. It's like even just getting shots on target at this moment in time is absolutely ridiculous. We just can't seem to do it. Um, I think just since since that losing streak began, like or after the, the winning streak ended and the losing streak began, we've seen a total change in the shape in general. Uh, whereas normally, you know, you would get the ball out to the right or the left. If we went out to the left to say Serrano, you would then have Alan Forrest in front of him. You would, or you would have uh, Craig Sibyl sort of more laterally. You put the ball out to the right hand side with Devlin. Devlin and uh, Josh Mullen would be doing the underlaps and overlaps and everything like that. Now Devlin gets the ball on the wing. Mullen is absolutely nowhere to be seen. It's like he's being asked to kind of play narrowly behind the striker, which isn't. That's not where you want Josh Mullen. You want him playing on the right wing to get those deadly balls, even across the face of goal, even going out for a corner. You know, it's so yeah. I think it's it's just been it's been really bad recently, and we seem to have we've tweaked something and it's not worked. But it didn't work the first week. It didn't work the second week. It didn't work the third week. It didn't work the fourth. You know where I'm going with this. Six weeks on, we're trying to continue with the same shit going on, and it's not working. You would think after three, four defeats in a row, we then get a draw against Rangers, and you're like, okay, okay, you know, maybe they're starting to click a wee bit, and then we get that absolutely abysmal performance on on Sunday. Nah, uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, just sort of, yeah, I'm gonna use a big word here, yeah, 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 uh, sort of encapsulates everything that's going on with Livingston at the moment. Um, I just, uh, it was pretty underwhelming. Like, I don't uh, think what helps as well is the constant rotation, especially with the goalkeeper, the constant rotation of the goalkeeper. We've played three goalkeepers this season. The left-back scenario with, you know, one minute you're playing Serrano there, then you've got Aaron Taylor-Sinclair coming in, and then you've got Kieran Brown playing at left-back when arguably he's a better as a, as a centre-half. Um, you know this this whole idea of not playing Forrest and uh, Mullen, I, I don't get that. They're two completely different styles of wingers. I don't think anyone thought that Poplatnik would start the game on Saturday. Hmm. You were thinking, right? He's brought Tiffany on at the end of the Rangers game for Robinson. You're thinking, right? Okay, he's going to get a couple of minutes to then be able to, you know, get a wee bit of match sharpness about him for Saturday. And then we play a guy who wasn't even in the squad against Rangers. <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. I, I don't know what's going through Davy's head at the moment. I know that maybe indicates to me that he's trying to fix it. But when you try and fix a system which is broken by playing the same system, it's not working. Thomas, what were or what was your moment from either Rangers or Motherwell? I, I, yeah, it was just a kind of. There was the disappointment of losing the white goal against Rangers, where I, I did think we were good, but to go for that positive onto the negative of the Motherwell game, it's just so disappointing. And I, I, I find it difficult to really add anything on top of what everyone said. It's just the lack of belief that we have when we're, when we're playing at the moment. Very one dimensional, very poor, very direct. It's kind of what everyone's been saying Livingston are for the last few years when we've really not been, but I I don't I don't have a massive amount to add. It's just shite. Jake, what were your moments of either game? Yeah, uh, kind of like Thomas actually, I think uh Owen and Povey have said quite a lot in general what I think we were all kind of thinking. Um just reiterate, I thought, yeah, I thought Poplatnik was great. Uh, I'm glad he's getting a shout. I think he deserves it. Um, yeah, obviously gave the penalty away, but I thought he actually played really well. 
and he was coming quite deep and he was kind of making things happen. Um, yeah, Rangers game was was pretty good, but I think you know we are. There's a a, a lot of time people are getting used to thinking that we do play shite football, and I've seen Livingston this season play really not shite football, and it does kind of when people are talking about like oh, you just do this, and I was just like, well we don't, and then they go, well I've watched the highlights and that's all you did. And I'm like, aye, well we don't do that. But well, we do. But things over. I, I know we can play better than that. That's why, you know, Liam, you made a point earlier in the week uh, on the Twitter going, you know, this is still amazing. But I'm so fucking like, we, I think we need to strive better for that because I think we are a really good side. And yeah, we're going to be slagging the performances at the moment and these last few weeks because we've been shite and rightly so. But it's still amazing what we're doing. But I don't give a fuck. Like, if we're shite, we're shite. Okay. But. The other thing is, uh, Martin Dale spoke about uh, is that we need to go back to the, the basics. And the fact is that we're playing such basic football now, I kind of really want to know what that is. You know, it didn't really strike me. I didn't have any confidence when he said that. So I'll go back to the basics. And so I think I mentioned this in the group. I think it was Paul who said, he was like, what do you mean, like, putting the ball in the net? And it's like... <laughs> like, is that, what, like... Is, is that what he fucking means? Like, well, we know that. Draw- Draw we graph a goal, ball, yeah, yeah, arrow. Goal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, is that what we're talking? <laughs> yeah, so that, that was kind of so I'm, I'm interested to see. But you know what? I've got I have got confidence that that it's gonna things are gonna change. And like you've you said before, that the rotation in the team has actually worked in our favour in the past. And Martin Dale thinking, going, right, this team have these attributes. Well, let's use our attributes to, to block them out. And they've worked. Yeah. But at the moment we really, the players look like they just need consistency of going, and maybe that's what he means by going back to the base. Okay, let's stick to exactly what we are good at instead of thinking about the other teams too much. Um, but yeah, I, it's been a bit shite, but I've, I've got confidence in the boys and Davy that it's going gonna, it's gonna to get better and we're, we're going to finish top six. We are delighted to say that we are now joined by a man that scored not just one, but two perfect hat-tricks for the Lions. Not only is he a key worker, he was a key player for Livingston's second division title win in 2011. He may not be a full-time sonographer, but believe me when I say he's an ultrasound guy. <laughs> ladies, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please welcome to Almond View, Dr. Kenny Jukka. That was some introduction. <laughs> I write them, I write them, so I'm taking <laughs> credit for them. One of my dad jokes I get ripped for. Actually, before before we get started, what's your favourite doctor joke? I goes into doctors, he says, Doctor, doctor, I think I've got a letter stuck up my arse. The doctor says to him, Right, mate, bend over, I'll have a look. Bends over and the doctor's like, Ooh, <sighs> Mate, I'm afraid that's just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! <laughs> I've genuinely never uh, heard that one before. That was cool. <laughs> Same here. Same here. Super. That's good. Uh, right, let's get stuck into the old playing career. Uh, so you started your professional career um, at Falkirk, but you were cursed with a lot of injuries during your time at the Bairns. And then you moved on to East Fife in 2002, where you first started making your name for yourself as the goal machine that you turned into, uh, which included a goal against Queen's Park to clinch promotion for the Fifers to Division 2 in 2003. So how did it feel finally being able to show off what you could do after a tough start at Falkirk, but then flourishing when you moved over to East Fife? Um, I mean, I, I, I would have to say I did enjoy most of my time at Falkirk, uh, despite the fact I, I broke my leg a couple of times, but, you know, I was was a part-timer at a full-time club, much like I was when I was uh, when I was at Livingston. Uh, but I was obviously at the other end of my career, so um, it was much harder to force my way into the team. I didn't have that respect that I made it, maybe had by the time I was a, a part-timer at Livingston, but um, I was concentrating on university, really. The, the football kind of just happened. It wasn't planned uh, doing it for fun I was actually playing pub football in the uh, July before I started university when I was I just turned 18 and 
we actually played in a a friendly against a junior team and I'd always been the kid that went along to a football team and like for a trial and sometimes like I wouldn't get picked or I wouldn't get in or like I was always getting rejected and then I played in this uh, for this amateur team against a junior team and there was another junior team uh, manager at the side watching as well and at the end of the game if the junior teams wanted to sign me and I was like ah I don't know what to do here. There's more than it's no me trying to get a game. It's like two folk fighting over me, and that had never happened before. <laughs> so um, my dad uh, gave me a good bit of advice, and he says, "Well, just choose one, but only sign like on an amateur basis." Mm. And I says, "Right, okay." So I signed amateur, and uh, I played with the junior team as an amateur, and then within about. Um, Three months, Falkirk kind of. I was scoring goals for this team, and Falkirk came in, and uh, I could because they moved the age group uh, date. Mm-hmm. Had got another year at under 18s so I had. I was previously it was like the first of August, and I missed the age group by like three weeks, and I was like the youngest in that year. And then they moved the age group, and I got another year at under 18 So I actually, through luck, really. Uh, got my chance to sign for Falkirk for uh, 40 quid a week um, and play for the under-18 team while I had just started uni. So I never done any by design. It just kind of happened. I was playing football for enjoyment and then that kind of happened. I was like, well, I might as well try it. Um, and uh, played for uh, for the under-18s. I played on loan at uh, a couple of junior teams, but unfortunately I broke my leg. So that probably helped me concentrate on my studies. I didn't get as distracted as I might have got if yeah. uh, you know, I was getting into the, if I was getting into the first team earlier, um, which might have happened if I hadn't had the injuries. I, I don't know what what would I would I have had to make, I've made a decision at that point when I wasn't finished my studies. Uh, so it didn't it, in the end partly because of the injuries, partly because I was part time, partly because I just wasn't that good at that time. Uh, it didn't work out and I was grateful to uh, East, the East Fife manager at the time now they were my only offer they were the only team that had any interest in me and it was only because when I, at my time at Falkirk uh, I was training with Forfa um, as I went to uh, Dundee Uni and the, one of the coaches at Forfa turned out to be the manager at East Fife and he had seen me like working hard to rehab for my uh, for my broken legs, and he knew me and had seen me in training. Nobody else really knew anything much about me, or, or other than the fact that I hadn't made it at Falkirk. So, really, that was my only for about twenty pound a week. I think I got signed with East Fife. Uh, I was lucky to get a senior club, to be honest with you, and then. Uh, it was just great to be like part of the first team and like getting to play every week. Whereas um, I hadn't really felt party before. I wasn't really training with Falkirk. I would turn up on a Saturday and hopefully get a, a, a place in the bench. Uh, it, it was East Five was brilliant because it was the first time I really felt party. It. After a whopping thirty-four goals in seventy-seven games for the Fifers, uh, you were picked up by the infamous Gretna FC. Uh, were there any other offers on the table after your time with East Fife? And what was it that sort of drew you towards Gretna? So, if I'm honest with myself, I had this plan that uh, I was going to finish my first year working in the hospital and then I would get my full registration with the GMC. And I'd saved, I was saving my money I was earning that year, partly because I had debt after being in uni. Uh, but partly because my plan was to like uh, go on trial and give myself six months, even if I didn't have a contract someplace. So I'd been, I had an agent at the time, I mean, uh, a guy called Kevin Drinkle, and he was talking to, um, I think it was Terry Butcher was the manager at Motherwell. And I'd previously, the previous season, uh, gone in to train with uh, St Mirren as a favour because I was off during the summer and I'd asked my manager at East Fife can I go and train someplace full time because that would be of benefit to me and East Fife 
Um, and uh, it was a, uh, is it John Coughlin that was the manager at St Mirren. So I had the idea that I was going to give it six months, uh, just like trying to train full time every day, put my best into it and uh, see what happened, basically, because I had that opportunity because I had something to fall back on, uh, which was a fortunate position to be in. I think my agent probably forced my arm a wee bit. He, um, Gretna were keen and I'd scored quite a few goals uh, against Gretna. Well, I say I had, but I think I, the manager of Gretna, I think, had, was a case of mistaken identity in one of the games. So, like, my strike partner uh, scored a hat trick in the in a game against Gretna. And I'm not saying we look like identical, but we're similar height. Um, I mean, I'm I'm definitely much better looking. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but I had scored a few goals against Gretna, but so did this guy, and he scored a hat trick in the game. And, and the manager, I, I remember, we were sitting. He was like, "Hey, he always scored against us. Remember that hat trick he scored against us?" And I was like, oh, I, I, "I don't even remember that hat trick." Uh, but I kind of just like was like nodding, and he was like desperate to sing me. So I was like, uh, in the end, uh, he probably thought I was better than what I was. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I kind of just, I, I maybe took the easy option in the end, saying, right, I'm going to get to go full time. I'll start in the third division, work my way up. Um, I was going to be getting paid, like even though I was getting paid less than what. I was getting paid uh, working as a doctor. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to give it a go. Mm, yeah. I, I maybe looking back, I, 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 I mean, I, I don't know, don't know if I can say I regret uh, signing, but I did have this idea that I would maybe try and get in at a higher level and like uh, give myself a, a shot of going round for trials. But I mean, I suppose maybe a, a bird in the hands worth two in the bush. I think everyone sort of knows the Gretna story, and they had back to back promotions. Cup final, played in Europe. Um, you were a big part of the journey for the first two seasons. Um, but then the 2006 season, when they were in the first division, like you spent a lot of that time on loan at Northampton. So like, what actually happened there? Like, what was the reason for that, considering the work that you'd already put in? Um, I suppose I probably would say that I never, ever got on with the manager or he never got on with me. Um, and uh, I think from sorry, Christmas, January time in the second division season when we were uh, the season we got to the, the Scottish Cup final yeah. I, I basically like, I, I was scoring pretty much all the time still like I, scored tw- I still scored 25 goals that season and the January he dropped me he, he dropped me for a, a, like a Scottish Cup game and uh, like all the press were like saying oh, you've dropped Kenny Duker but like uh, blah 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 and he was just he, he, he just uh, was like I, c- I can do I can do what I want basically and uh, I hadn't really done anything wrong and we just didn't really get on with each other and um Unfortunately for me and unfortunately for the person he dropped me for, the, the boy fractured his fibula in like this the game that he started that like in that game. So I was back in. So again I was fortunate probably to stay in the team yeah. uh, because of an injury or get into the team because of an injury. Um but the relationship was like not good with Faye. And that was a year and a half in that uh, the, the relationship was not good. And uh, starting the first division season, um, I didn't want. I, I just didn't want to be there. I had, I had originally only signed a two-year contract, and at the end of the third division season, I didn't really want to extend it because I was. Uh, I suppose I was flying high, and I was like, well. I probably want to move on for this, like um, take the opportunity. But the the problem was that, as I said before, if I hadn't signed that, ext- I extended the contract um, for another uh, 
three years. I had one year left and I extended it by another two years. Um, I, I felt as if I was forced, I forced to do that because, as I said earlier, Gretna, if I hadn't been playing in the team, it probably still would have won the second division. So yeah. uh-huh. was that like, he, he could have sat me for a year and then when they began to play, and the whole reason I gave up medicine was to play football. And I was worried that if I didn't sign this extension, I wouldn't get to, uh, I wouldn't get to play. So, but the relationship was like dead basically by the, the start of the first division season, and I started a few games, and I was a sub in a few games, and then I got sent off for. I basically got subbed on with about three minutes to go, and we were winning two one, and the guy went to clear the ball up the line, and I've kind of just like trying to do my best to block it up the line. I wasn't even, it wasn't even a tackle. And uh, I slid in to try and block it. And the guy had followed through and he never even touched him. And he went up and like he went down as if like he'd been shot. And the referee came over and I was like, oh, you're not going to book me for that. And then he, 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 he pulled out the red card. And I was like, are you, are you actually kidding me? Like, it's the only sending off in my, my life. Like, like professional career, any other career, it's the only time I've ever been sent off. And uh, had a run in with the manager again on on that. So he he said came out and supported me and said oh, I was never a sender off. Blah blah blah. Then a week later, he says you're fined a week's wages. And I was like, but you just agree, like you said that I shouldn't have been sent off. And he he, um, he basically was doing it to assert his authority. Like, um, it wasn't a, like, as far as I'm concerned, you find somebody to deter them by producing a behaviour again. Right. And, like, I, I clearly didn't need find for, like, something that shouldn't have been a sending off in the first place, that he actually said that. Um, and uh, certainly wasn't he going to do it again because it was the first time I'd ever been sent off. So, but... The, after that, I think I played a few more games, but I put in a transfer request um, like the end of November. Um, and uh, I basically did that public, although there was like the, the transfer uh, windows. Yeah. I wanted everybody to know that I was not playing because I'd fell out with them, no, because I was shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but it took, like, I was training with the youth team uh, for two months. And uh, couldn't I just I wasn't I wasn't ever going to play for uh, for this guy again. And it was the last day of the transfer window, and I was just resigned to the fact that I was going to be training with the youth team mm. at the end of the season. I was thinking I'm going to I'm going to chuck this now. I'm just going to go back to medicine. I'm I can't be I can't be bothered with this. Uh-huh. Um, with one person controlling your happiness, like your career or the rest, I was like, I didn't need this. Um, and on the last day of the transfer window, I was basically at work, so I was doing a work at the hospital at Wishaw Hospital, and I was in a, I was in my clinic. I've seen patients, and I got a phone call, and it was like the director of football at Gretna, and he phoned me a couple of times. So I'd hung up, he kept phoning me. Eventually, I answered it between patients and she says, uh, Northampton Town want to take you on loan. I was like, great. Um, what league do they play in? Because <laughs> I had no idea. And I was like, actually, where is Northampton? I've never... Is it, is it like is it like a, a shoot-off of Southampton? Even, like, I, have no, I had no idea. I thought they were going to be like Derby rivals or something. Um, and... Uh, I, had a, I was like, right, let me have a quick Google. So I'm like Googling where Northampton is and what league they're in. And I'm like looking at this and I'm like, they're in, they're in League One in England. That's, that's maybe a bit of a, a stretch for me because like I'd only played like a Scottish First Division. Yeah. And hadn't really had a run, even had a run of games in the Scottish First Division. Um. I was like, well, I've got nothing. I've got absolutely nothing to lose here. So I just, uh, on that, I just said, right, I'm signing. So I had to drive down for Wishaw 
to Gretna, sign the papers there, then drive up the road, grab my stuff. And then on the Thursday, I drove all the way down to Northampton. And uh, they gave me the number nine shirt. And uh, I, I, I was like, oh, my God. And it had, it had my name on the back of the shirt. And that was uh, like the first time I'd ever had my name <laughs> on the back of my shirt. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm in my depth here. I'm, I'm going to come a cropper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to embarrass myself down here. Um, and uh, I didn't. So it, it went really well. It, like, fans like really took to me. And they would always be like dressing up in white coats and dressed up as nurses and doctors and all the rest of it. And like, they had songs for me and everything. And like, it was absolutely brilliant. It was the best. It was the best football, like, way better than any time I had done at Gretna. It was absolutely brilliant. I was get like I went for like, training with the youth team, and then I think ten days later I was playing with uh, Northampton at the city ground against Nottingham Forest in front of twenty five thousand fans. I was running about on that pitch, going, "Oh my God, what what's happened here? <laughs> what is this?" Um, I, I scored I scored a few important goals for them because we were kind of um, in the kind of relegation. A conversation when I when I went down and in the second month I was there I scored three goals in four games and it was all against teams that were uh, round about us and we ended up like just jumping up over loads of teams and finishing uh, mid table so the, the 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 manager liked me the fans liked me and the, I wanted to go back there but Gretna blocked it um, the following season. They got promoted to the Premier League and they, they um, basically shafted me uh, again um, and they uh, didn't allow me to go back to Northampton and I didn't start the season at Gretna uh, after being promised stuff and it was a different manager and yeah. uh, then towards the end of the transfer window again they were like oh, uh, Owen Coyle at St Johnston's been on the phone one year on loan and I was like what are you actually what you actually talking about? Like, I had a move to Northampton in League One, like, better than the standard that I'm playing, well, no playing with Gretna, and mm. New Year, New Year won me, New Year saying I can go on loan to a first division team. Like, I, you've absolutely shafted me. I'm like, uh, unbelievable. And I says, if, if um, so if I'm, you're saying I'm allowed to leave now, I'm at least going to phone Northampton and say, Look, I'm allowed to go now. But they'd already used up their budget by that time. Find another uh, target man uh, and it just wasn't a, it just wasn't an option. So he, the, the, the Gretna were like, so do you know want to go to St. Johnston? I says, I fucking want to go to St. Johnston because I've already told you. I've been telling you for the last eight months that I didn't want to be here. So any place that I can go, it's not here. I'm gone. That was the end. That was the end. Of, that was the end of that. But I, I had to go back again because Aye, yeah, Johnston was like an emergency loan, and uh, it was only for ninety three days maximum. And the ninety three days was up, like out with a transfer window. So the rules were I couldn't no go back to Gretna. But by that time, Gretna were panicking because they were basically shit. And we're getting beat all the time. And the manager at the time, David Irons, was like, look, I pro- if you come back, I promise you'll play every minute of every game. I was like, well, I mean, that's a decent uh, deal. If I'm going to get to play every minute of every game in the Premier League, then I've got, I've got my opportunity for the next six weeks or so to put myself in the short window. Mm. Um or, or even if it was to be for the rest of the season. So we'd be getting, like, beat, like, I think we were getting beat 4-1 four, four at Ibrox, and I was trying, like, uh, I was, like, full 100% effort the whole time I was in it. Because I was like, see if I, see if I get a couple of consolation goals. What they're going to see is Kenny Duca goals. It doesn't matter if we get beat 4-2 or 4-3. Like, so I was like, and I think I scored six or seven goals in like 11 or 12 games and Aye. I don't remember my move to, to America so um, it kind of worked out well in the end but 
uh, it was a, a difficult way to get there. And I, I've, I would have to say, although I said about no one to go to St Johnston originally, I, if I could like describe any place that was the best place for me to be for the longest, it was St Johnston. I had a brilliant time when I went on that loan. We won the Challenge Cup. We pretty much won every week. I scored a load of goals. And then that basically got me another opportunity with St Johnston in the Premier League a couple of years later. So St Johnston yeah. was probably the place where I played my best football in my career. Um, so it, it all worked out very well looking back on it. Ah, as you touched on, uh, obviously you went back to Gretna and scored a few goals and it got your move to uh, the MLS. But before that, there was uh, rumours of Barcelona. What can you tell us about them? Uh, well, so, so when I was back in the Premier League with Gretna, I was obviously trying to engineer a move. So I had a gentleman's agreement with Brooks at the time that if something really good came along, uh, he wouldn't. He, he would let me go. Basically, um, yeah. I think they had probably knew that we were going to get relegated by that time. Uh, so he wasn't going to stand me stand my way. So I wasn't prepared to just leave it to my agent. So I just I put together like a CV, and it was a wee bit more difficult then to get like video footage and that. So I had a, like a couple of guys that had done stuff with a uh, uh, Sky. So David Tanner. He managed to get some highlights and stuff for me on a disc for because Sky had covered like Scottish Cup games, yeah, and they had a they had also covered one of your games live with um, Northampton, and I had some decent footage from uh, for there and the, the goals I'd scored with Northampton, and I had the full match for the Challenge Cup final with uh, St Johnston. I had. Uh, go man of the match and so I had all great footage then and uh, I, I put it all together and I uploaded it onto like a website now uh, back then I mean all that sounds very easy these days but yeah. back then it wasn't that easy to I didn't even think YouTube existed like <laughs> it was like I had this random pal a pal who put this on a random university site. He worked for this university and he put it on this university server for me. And I basically sent out this CV with this link to this footage that was on this university Blackpool server or something like that. And they uh, sent this CV out to like hundreds say, teams, like every team in America, every team in Australia. I was going for like Austria, the second and third levels of Germany, Switzerland, I was Switzerland, the lower leagues in Italy. Like I was sending things to everywhere. Like I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't picking the the best teams because I know you mentioned Barcelona. But one day my mate was like, yeah, "I dare you, I dare you to send it to Barcelona." And I was like, "All right, we'll just send it for a laugh." And it, out of like 200 odd emails or whatever that I sent, I only got like uh, four replies. <laughs> like everybody, and I put in a lot of effort. I had like translated stuff into German, like uh, I had tra- translated stuff into like the Swiss language. Like I had, I had done all that to try and like uh, put myself forward, uh. and none of them replied at all. And in America, I was uh, although I was I was kind of sending stuff to generic email accounts. So like uh, I don't know, it would be like info at uh, stgallon dot com or something like that. Whereas right. whereas in America, they had like um, an MLS website, and if you looked at the front office, they would have something like you know, like the ticket guy was called John Smith, and his address was John Smith at realsaltlake.com I was like wait a minute here I bet you all the employees in Real Salt Lake and that all got email addresses like that so I was like using the manager's name the assistant manager's name and I was getting all these delivery failures but some of them got through so I got through a Columbus Crew replied they were interested uh, Real Salt Lake and Houston Dynamo Real Salt Lake had put on like this 
uh, we've got dibs on Kenny Juker because we saw him first. Like they, they were because you signed with the league, they could they could oh, do that. Aye, aye, aye. Um, so they were the first ones that were allowed to offer me a contract. Um, and the the advice I got for the agents over there was you take the first contract because MLS didn't want the players like you dictating where you go. You know, like um, so you'll get offered less at the next team because the MLS office will be like, nah, we're just going to draft them. Ah, so, right, okay. Anyway, the, the story about Barcelona was that I did send it to Barcelona and I did get a reply for them, and it was the only other team that replied to me. But it was basically like a wee put down, like, uh, I, we've got an extensive scouting network. Um, thanks for thanks for uh, thanks for sending it. If we if we're interested, we'd already care about you typing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was quite that. I made that wee bit up, but it was like uh, it was like that. Uh, if we're interested, we'll, we'll be in touch. <laughs> oh man, that is class. Who's to reply to? No, I, I mean, how many jobs? How many jobs do you apply for and uh, and never hear anything? Oh, no, exactly. Uh, but of course, they at least gave me the courtesy of replying. On the 18th of January 2011, you joined Gary Boland's banter bus, the mighty Livingston FC. And on that same day, you scored a perfect hat trick against one of your former teams, East Fife. Can you talk us through that day? Um, and how long were you aware of the interest from Livy? And when when did you find out you were when, when did you find out you were starting? So I was at Falkirk at the time. Um, again, I was part time with Falkirk, and uh, the manager was Stephen Presley. And I think I'd been on the Saturday we played against Queen of the South, and I was on the bench. And I got home, and he phoned me, and he says, uh, "Livingston, I've been on the phone." Um, and he basically why I sign you. And he says, I'm not going to force you to go because you're a good professional and I'm not, I'm not forcing you at the door, but I, I'll, I'll be prepared to let you go if uh, if you want to go. So it's up to you, basically. And I was like, well, to be honest, I'm not happy, no, no playing. I'm, I'm too old for that. I didn't even know how long I'm going to keep playing for. So if we can sort it out financially, um, then, then I'm, I want to go. Um, so we got that sorry do it quite quickly. I think that like that was like the Saturday, and then we we played on the, the Tuesday or the Wednesday, did we? What was it? You can maybe correct me on that, but I, I signed. I basically signed for Livy in the Starbucks at uh, Fort Valley Royal at, in Larbor. So I either signed there. <laughs> On the Monday, it probably was the Monday, and then we had the game the next. We had the game the next day, and uh, I'm not sure if the manager said to me that I would definitely be starting. Um, I'm not sure if that conversation was had. I, I feel as if I maybe assumed that like things had a bump for Livy. I think at that time, and mm. he was looking for something just to. You know, give the, the team and the squad a wee boost. Um, so, uh, I, I think I, I assumed that I was going to be starting. And then, obviously, the first game was back at my old stomping ground at, uh, at East Fife. Um, I'd already scored two hat-tricks against East Fife uh, prior to that. Um, I think, though, <laughs> before, the, before the game... My biggest concern was that the shorts were tight as any and they were like cycling shorts. It was like embarrassing. <laughs> like I could hardly get the shorts on. I was like, oh, this is so uncomfortable. I, it was the away strip. I was like, oh my God, I can't cope with this. But then the rest is history. <laughs> I did concede a penalty in that game as well, actually. I don't know if you were going to uh, call me out in that one. Well, I did get a hat trick. I did, I did concede a pen. No, I think yeah. I had scored and then I think... Um, no, I'm not sure if I made it one each and then conceded a penalty and it went two one. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, oh my god, this is like not a good start. I think I think we got a man sent off as well, and uh, I, I would have to say that I think the substitution when they brought uh, Ian Russell on was the was a turning point rather than a hat trick. Uh, I was just lucky enough to get on the end of them. Uh, 
I think he turned the game round really when he came on and he was fully running with the, uh, the fact we were doing to 10 men as well. So uh, it was... It was on the verge of no being a good debut. Uh, that, uh, the, the challenge from Mikko Byrne was probably one of the greatest challenges I've ever seen. It was a proper <laughs> two foot straight down. You could see it coming as well. Mikko Byrne oh. was just one of those players that like, he just he just went for it. He didn't care. He didn't care. And then argued with the ref. He should have to cheat to argue about it. I know. He had to cheat to be like, like, incredulous as if, like, how have I been sent off? <laughs> I've never seen a challenge like it. Actually, he's lucky. He never, he never really caught. He never really caught the person. That was lo- that was the lucky thing. He never really caught them. But it was like it was a ridiculous like lunge. Bobby Barr told us to dig you out for never being at training. Uh, <laughs> but remember, <laughs> but remember reading somewhere uh, that you were training at Sterling Albion during your time with us. Uh, is that true? Aye, so uh, Jockey Scott um, would let me, Jockey Scott and then more latterly uh, Greg McDonald were the managers there and they, they allowed me to uh, basically train there um, in the week, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays and then I would turn up at Livy on a Saturday. Like, I, I mean, I, I, I did, I was turning up for training at Livy whenever I could, like if I if I was on holiday <laughs> for the hospital or for work, I would be at Livy training. Like, um, it just was a bit erratic because obviously that was my, my main job. But um, I, I was training with, was training with Stirling Albion the whole time I was at, um, at Livy when I, I suppose it stuck in their throat a wee bit when I scored the hat trick against them. I'm just going to ask that as well. Yeah, it was a bit awkward. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I was pals with all of them by that point, so there was, like, obviously there was banter uh, um, and that, but uh, we weren't in the same league. It was just so happened we threw them in that cup, eh? So mm. it was it was like I was... I had done that similar thing before when I was at Falkirk. I would train with, train with Forfern and Broth when I was younger, so um, it's just like I was... Basically, the manager was doing me a favour doing Livingston a favour, doing Gary Bowling a favour to let me uh, let me train there. Why is Bobby Barr uh, digging me out for not being at training? We won the league, did we know? He's just a wee wido, is he not? He's a wee wido. <laughs> From January 2011 until the end of the season, you managed an impressive eight goals uh, on our way to securing a second consecutive promotion. And then your good form continues into the 2011 and 2012 season uh, back in Division 1. And you finally got your first goals at the Macaroni Bowl against Dundee in a 4-2 win. Even though you only joined in January that year, did the fact you hadn't scored at home play in your mind at all? Or was it something as a footballer you don't really think about? I think that's the first realisation that uh, that was the case. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I had no clue, no idea, no idea whatsoever. No, I feel bad. Maybe, maybe, maybe just forgetting about um, things was why uh, I uh, managed to keep my confidence up because I just, like, when folks say stuff to you or try to get in your head, it wasn't really affecting me or I wouldn't let that kind of thing um, bother me. I, as long as the team was winning, really, that was the thing for me. I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if... Um, I don't know if I would even describe myself as a... It's like a goal scorer. Like that, I don't really feel as if that was like the main, uh, main part of my game. I just think that was a, a byproduct. Like I, I feel as if I was uh, was a target man, and like I was a handful, and I occupied mm-hmm. like always more than one defender, and and it, it, they they couldn't couldn't handle it. Um, and and you would wear, I would wear them down, and then I would get my rewards towards the end of the games, or my teammates would get the rewards. For, like it wouldn't be pretty when you're watching me, but like I, I think uh, I think most of the teams that I played in were successful, whether or no I was scoring uh, all the time. I went through phases where I maybe would get on the score sheet quite quite a few times, um, but I, I I think uh, I think I was an awkward. 
bugger to play against. That that not not that I had loads of skill, but I was like I didn't think there's many folk that liked playing against me. Do you remember what the goals were that season? Obviously, there was no playoffs for promotion, but that winning feeling from the second division, maybe putting your head, you know, you've got a chance of challenging, or was it just kind of stay in the league mid table? I think uh, consolidating in the. Uh, first division was certainly my, uh, my mentality. Um, you never know what's going to happen. You're going to try and win every game that you that you play in. I think you had to be realistic as to what the uh, expectations would be in that scenario. I mean, uh, even Rangers didn't get three consecutive promotions uh, through the the Scottish League. So I think. Mm-hmm. I think the club needed to consolidate in the first division, which um, we were we were doing. I mean, I think we were doing very well, even when Gary Bowling got the sack. I mean, I, I actually still can't get my head around how that um, how that went down. Like, it was such a shock at the time. Like, uh, uh, I, I felt as if like we were. We were doing well at the time. We were in no, there was no danger we were going to get relegated. Um, we were going to be safely, safely in the middle of the league uh, and and kind of, kind of pushing on a bit. Just touching on what what you said uh, just about uh, Gary Boland getting sacked. Uh, so obviously you can so you've kind of said already, but you know how did you feel when you heard the news? And because you weren't really training with the squad as much, did you find out the news later than the rest of the squad? Or Contrary to what Bobby Barr said, I was actually at training that day. <laughs> Basically, like, during that season, like, things were going pretty well. Like, and, uh, I, I was pretty much playing every week and uh, I, was, I was playing all right. I think I was probably getting subbed... Um, like 70 minutes, 75 minutes a lot of the time. And that probably as a part-time player didn't help um, like because the fitness starts to, like the match fitness started because I wasn't getting the full 90 and I uh, was a wee bit disappointed with that. And uh, But things were going well and Gary Bowen had come to me, I think just before Christmas, we were at, um, we were training at Broxburn on their AstroTurf or whatever and I was in tra- I was in training again this day, contrary to Bobby Barr, uh, and that he had pulled me aside. Gary Bowen said, "I, I want to, uh, I want to extend you for another year." Um, and I was like, "Well, um, for I don't know what I want to do. I would rather, rather just see how things go towards the end of the season because I'm getting a bit older now. I'm going to be thirty-two, and like I, I was, my wife was pregnant." Your second uh, boy, I was working more than full time as a doctor and trying to play part time, get to training when I could in the mornings, uh, also training in the evenings, working full time during the week. I wasn't sure if I, I, I was going um, to want to stay on for another year. I says, but I says, but if I if I keep playing and, you, and, and I'm enjoying it. If I keep playing, I'll no sign for anybody else bar Livingston. So I'm no, I'm no saying to you, I'm looking for something better. I'm saying I'm actually no sure what um, the, uh, I'm going to decide. But if I sign for anybody, it'll, if I'm staying in football, you'll be first. You'll get first dibs on me. <laughs> that was fine. So like, I was like, well, that, we'll just carry on enjoying it. Blah blah blah, and then. I don't know when it was uh, after Christmas that um, he uh, he got sacked, and I was like, "Oh, this is a disaster!" And then it was an even bigger disaster when the the new manager came in and who it was. Um, and I, I I just went straight to the chairman as soon as I found out that it was John Hughes, and I said, "Look, I, you you need to get rid of me. Uh, I, I I'm I didn't want to be here anymore. I think he didn't want me either, but." As soon as I heard his name, I was I was straight into the chairman. I was like, I'm I'm uh, going away. 
We love Gary Bolan, and we were actually, you know, gutted when he was sacked, and we've heard some amazing stories just from ex-players and his teammates. Have you got any mental Gary Bolan stories for us? The boys went away for some, uh, it was like a, the Christmas night out, and they all went to Liverpool. The boys had this thing in the morning where they would all, um, be like five of them, and I'm, I, I still kind of get my head around how they worked to who won, but it would be like rock, paper, scissors... Right? And there'd be five of them and they'd all be like showing something or and then somehow they would arrive at a loser and the loser had to make like the morning tea and coffee for all the other guys that were in the rock, paper, scissors. They were building this up like this trip to Liverpool and that and they, they, they had decided that they were gonna there was four or five of them. They were gonna have this game on the bus on the way down a rock, paper, scissors, like what they did for the tea and the coffee. And uh, but on this occasion, the loser was going to have to get a tattoo, the gaffer's name on them. Like a real, like a real tattoo. Like a real tattoo. So um, Paul Watson lost the, uh, lost the game. So he... He had, and I, th- I think it was like the the. I didn't even know. Maybe the other four of them had like all been like uh, stitching them up basically, and he didn't can. And four of them have went paper. Oh, it's and, a stitch up. And Paul Watson went rock, right? <laughs> and uh, well, he lost. So on that trip to Liverpool, basically the first thing they did when they go off the bus was went to a tattoo parlor. <laughs> Paul Watson got a tattoo on his ankle, he a fist, and the the gaffer's nickname, Bobo. <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't a wee tattoo either. It was like it was a big tattoo. And then so he, he obviously he got this for the rest of the season. I don't know if he still got it. Um, I haven't spoken to him for ages, but um, I he, he, I think he showed his mum. And his mum went, ah, oh, no. ah, ah, that's a funny temporary tattoo. Uh, oh, and no. it was fucking real. <laughs> You've touched on uh, John Hughes already. Excuse my ignorance, and I don't really know obviously what went on because Yogi is a really popular character, you know, and a lot of people like him. So uh, obviously you guys didn't have a good relationship. Can you talk a bit about that? I'm not really sure it was uh, m- my relationship uh, in particular, but um, my dad was the uh, the club doctor at Falkirk. Um, he's a, he was a GP in, uh, in Denny, and uh, he had taken on the role with the practice as the as the club doctor at, at Falkirk. And uh, basically, there were uh, injured players, and uh, John Hughes was basically. Um, bullying the players to play when they shouldn't play and against my dad's um, medical advice and uh, so my dad obviously was uh, concerned about this um, Mm -hmm. as I was putting the players at risk and uh, he went to the he went to the board and to say that this wasn't on and uh, the board uh, or the chairman or whatever uh, basically, one they prepared to intervene. So uh, my dad basically r- resigned because uh, the concerns uh, the uh, the safety of the players at the time. He couldn't. He couldn't. He couldn't work under those uh, those conditions. Right. Okay. That was it. There was a big bust up, uh, and that was basically the story between my dad and John Hughes and the. The, the chairman and that at Falkirk at the time. I just wasn't prepared to to, uh, to be involved with, with a, a manager like that. I'd already been, I'd already yeah. been in a situation where um, Greta, where the, the, uh, I didn't agree with a lot of the stuff that the manager would, would do or get up to, and I, I certainly didn't want to be in that situation again. So how frustrating was it that you were put out on loan to Steny that season? You chose. You chose. To, did you choose to go to Senna's Muir's in the end? He he didn't. He he wasn't bad with me. Like see see when see con, like obviously I've said um, 
I I didn't want to be there, but he was he wasn't he like uh, it wasn't he difficult to me like when he came in. He mm-hmm. he was um, whether he knew I had went to the the chairman and asked to uh, to leave, but he he basically said that you're you're not going to play, <laughs> which yeah. it's fine. Like so, if somebody's honest with you, that's fine. Like I, I I've uh, I didn't have any problem with uh, somebody being honest to me so he, he didn't treat me with any disrespect or anything when when I was there but uh-huh. like neither of us wanted to um, uh, work with each other which is, mm-hmm. which is fine so um, what happened was that uh, East Fife were in for me but, like, they wanted me to go back there and uh, Dennis Muir uh, had came in for me and basically they were like I chose to go to Stennis Muir because mainly because I had had such a good time at uh, East Fife and uh, I was a bit concerned about um, having not played for a a period of time um, before I went on loan and I was a bit worried about um, taking a lot of money for East Fife and then no living up to the previous expectations that um, when I was younger. Yeah. Um, so I probably took the easy option of going to Stennis Muir to the end of the season because, again, East Fife were saying, look, we'll give you that and you tell us how long you want your contract. And I was like, well... I already told you earlier, I wasn't even sure if I was going to play past the end of the season. I was only going to if I was yeah. enjoying things. So I suppose Stennis Moore was kind of the last kind of thing. Am I going to enjoy going part-time, properly going part-time? Um, I'll give it a try. And, and, and I, I would have to admit, probably I was a bit scunnered with like, the way that Barry Bowen had lost his job and mm-hmm. like things had been going really well at Livy and I was probably, my heart wasn't in the move to, uh, to Stennis Muir and I didn't do myself or Stennis Muir justice when, when I went there, um, which is a, probably a, a big regret. Uh, but uh, I, I just, I feel as if I had kind of, I was scunnered by it that time. I wasn't, in, wasn't really thinking what uh, you probably should be thinking when you're playing, when you're playing football. I was... I was more worried about like my wife was uh, getting further on in her pregnancy, and another uh, my, my wee one, my other wee one, he was only two, and it was just time away, and I I I, I think I was just scunnered, and I I, 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 uh, I probably would have been better just staying at Livy to the end of the season and no bother playing. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, it didn't go very well at Stennis Muir either. You had some decent strike partners when you were at Livy. Uh, Ian Russell, Rory Boulding, Robbie Winters, Rafa De Vita, Mark McNulty, to name some. Um, was there anyone that you, you really liked playing with? Was there anyone that you thought, nah, they're a bit of a prick? <laughs> <laughs> Best player I played with was David Bingham. Uh, obviously, yeah. former, former, former Levy player. But we did not get on on the pitch like, <laughs> he, he like was used to moan at me like something rotten the whole time um, I, but we did get on though like I, 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 I'm I'm, uh, I'm no saying that. like we get on like off the pitch we'd like go on the night out we'd go on fine like uh but like he used to own and slate me like all the time, and despite the fact I think we scored like I think we scored about sixty eight goals between us, the two of us, and like about thirty games or something like that. But like uh, on the pitch, like you, like it was as if he, it was as if he hated me. But like <laughs> maybe if it wasn't like that, I wouldn't have scored as many goals. Like mm. he certainly set me up with plenty. Like you, yeah. like. Um, and get on fine with him now and I still kind of talk to him text him occasionally in fact I got his uh, son drew me a uh, 
me a picture for my for my room for the kids. Uh, to, like with a load of like cartoon characters. I don't know if you can. It's just doing the doing in the uh, corner there. That one there. Oh yeah. He drew, his, his son drew that for me. Oh. Um, so like, Jeez. so like we like I'm I, I, at the time though. Like it was just like it was honestly it was like all the time. But I mean, we we were destroying teams. I, th- I just felt as if we should have been like having a laugh and like enjoying ourselves, but he was like <laughs> more serious. But maybe that's uh, maybe that's why why I did uh, why I did well with him. Anyway, going back to your your question, uh, the Levy guys were great. Like I, I like I, I, uh, I had a great I had a great time. Like uh, we uh, all the guys. I'm um, there was a, there was a thing when. Uh, it was kind of the start of the, the first division season and uh, I took the huff with the manager, Gary Bolin, because he, um, we played our bro through, I think we hammered them like five or six, something like that. I didn't score in the game, but like we'd, we'd absolutely hammered them. And then on Saturday, just like like there was no warning or anything, I, just, I was dropped and he had just, he had signed... Rory Bolden for just recently and basically Rory Bolden was in instead of me. I had had no no warning and I was absolutely raging. <laughs> like I, I, if you if you're honest with me and you speak to me, that's fine, but it just it was all it was like I was like I was just completely blindsided and uh, obviously we, in a game that we would had absolutely destroyed the other team, I was like, that's this is Unbelievable, and like I, I, I was obviously raging. Like I was trying my best, no to like let it show. Uh-huh. I felt that I had to go to Rory and say, to, and like I pulled him aside after, like as soon as I could after the the, the team was announced. So I was like, I was like Rory, look, I'm the, 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 this is nothing again, nothing against you. I want you to go there and do. De- as well as you can, take your chance and go for it. See if you see me raging. It's no, I'm no raging at you. I'm, I'm annoyed <laughs> at the way that this is when this is when doing, and I'm a hundred percent. I'll support you. And I got on, and I got on really well. When I felt as if like if he'd seen me raging, he might have thought that I was raging with him. I cleared oh. there with him before, like I had. Obviously, I had to bite my tongue and all that for the the game, but then. I had a bit of an argument with Gary Bolin after it. Um, it was, it, it's, it's not really about getting dropped. Everybody gets dropped. It was just the toll way that I was totally blindsided by it. Um, because everybody deserves to play. It's just like see when you're see when you're like feeling good and like you're you're feeling confident and your team's winning and that like that type of thing just like crushes you like crushes your confidence. Um, so, but that, that that didn't take away from anything else that happened because I mean I was back in the team and playing and regularly after that it was just a that was just a kind of a, a blip and so in, in short I got on brilliantly with Rory Bolton despite the kind of start uh, there um, and the other guys were great as well like um, I, I didn't it was just a great time to be at Livy like they, they brought in like a Although I wasn't there that often, bought a table tennis table. They were like playing every morning. It was like there was like a table tennis, uh, like a uh, competition every single morning. It was like great, but it was great banter, eh? Boys, have you got any questions that you want to ask Kenny just now? While we open up, mine's is a bit it's non non living related. To be honest, just uh, I just thought I saw on the news today. Like former Scotland defender Gordon uh, McQueen, um, his daughter was speaking up about dementia and heading in football, and it made me think. Well, we've got Kenny on tonight. You know what? An opportunity to get a professional in medicine, as well as somebody who, let's be honest, like good at heading. That was one of your top top parts of your game. So I was wondering, just your opinion on 
that dementia and heading in football. It's a bit serious for me, sorry. I can't <laughs> say that after all this stuff has come out that I, I have no, I can't say I've no worried about it, <laughs> given that that was like one of the main uh, parts of my game. I was probably, that was probably one of my biggest strengths. Like, there weren't many uh, players or defenders that could uh, beat me consistently in the air. Um and there were a few head clashes and all the rest of it, and like I, I'm, I'm quite, um, I'm quite into the uh, NFL, and uh, a lot more um, like evidence and that about CTE um, over in uh, the states in relation to um, the. Uh, NFL and there's been various uh, high profile um, cases over there and um, like suicides and uh, I think Junior Seau was like an amazing uh, NFL player and uh, he committed suicide and there was the recent, um, there's been claims that the recent guy Vincent Jackson who was another guy who was in Pro Bowls and everything and uh, there was also, I mean, even if you look at wrestling, there was like a obviously the tragic story, uh, Chris Benoit. So there's been loads of stuff over the years, and there's been uh, this CTE has been um, put forward as a as a reason for these types of things. Even the guy Aaron Hernandez, there were there was chat if you've seen the documentary about. Know, brain damage and how that affected behavioural stuff. So it's difficult to know, certainly, um, about how much a contributing factor, but there's certainly been chat for a while. I, m- I remember when I was in MLS that there was a guy, uh, they, they had this thing where it was like a, it was like a head, like you know how in this, the uh, rugby they've got these caps yeah. They were at the rugby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had invented this thing for soccer. It went round here for like hitting the ball. I mean, that's never really taken off, but that was like back in like 2008. They were talking about, you know, heading the ball. And I take my wee boy's football team. He's, he's born in 2009. And you're not allowed to practice heading in uh, training at all. I mean, you're allowed to head it in games if it comes to your head, but. Yeah. Not allowed to these days practice headers at training. Um, I think that's a that, that's a big thing now. I don't know. Like I I, I don't know if uh, the balls have changed over the years. Um, is there uh, has there been uh, the same kind of medical cover uh, and you know the the rugby I've had like concussion, head injury, subs for years, which we've not really had in football. And the one, and you maybe didn't remember this, but the one one that sticks in my memory was this Uruguayan player. He was like, it was in like the World Cup or something like that. And it, was, it wasn't it was that long ago. He was like one of the defenders and he was like staggering. He took this blow to the head and he was staggering all over the place. It looked as if he must have been seeing like four. He, he was cleared and he was allowed to go back onto the pitch and I'm just like watching that going this is absolutely crazy sometimes you've got to protect the players for themselves mm-hmm. that's I, I suppose that's a wee bit what I was saying earlier about my dad you've got to like uh, you've got to be an advocate for these players like because players it's players livelihoods they're worried about like letting people down they're worried about letting their family down they're worried about how this is going to impact financially if they like didn't want to go on. You've got to take that away from them, and the doctor's got to be the one that says, "Oh, it's it's done," and they're better at that in America and at the rugby than they are at football. And I'm glad that that's coming out with football now. Um, I think it's more difficult to extrapolate how what heading uh, does. Um, I don't know if there's enough. Uh, evidence because people get dementia so I don't know what the figures are if you took all these professional footballers and you took another group that's like matched up for the general population is the percentage 
dementia higher in these football players? I, I don't know the answer to that. There may have been studies done. Uh, it'd be interesting maybe to, to look into that. But uh, the, you certainly worry. And I remember like, heading the ball a few times and my ears ringing because it's come at you hard or it, you've, you've headed it on the top of your head. It's like a spinning ball and um, you, you've maybe not got the right contact on it. I mean, it doesn't feel like anything. If you make a great timing and you... you it off your, your forehead and you, 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 your timing is spot on, it doesn't feel like you've touched the ball and this ball can fly off your, your head if your timing's right. But see if you get that timing wrong, it can, like, even the ball hitting you in the head can cause you a, a concussion. I'm hoping, I'm hoping all my flick on so they've just skiffed They've just skiffed my head so it's no being like uh, <laughs> I've not lost too many brain cells. <laughs> My question, so obviously you've juggled and you've touched on it, two very demanding careers. Like, Do you think that ever affected your game at all? Trying to juggle both? Or did you just kind of take it in your stride? Obviously it was you know, demanding from your time certainly, as you've said, but how, how did you feel it kind of balanced out? Um, I, it's, it's always been a... It's always probably take like one's taken away from the other at different times. Um, I suppose uh, examples would be that you know if you're and it's the same for all part-time players. If you are if you are doing something full time, and I often think that I was fortunate that I wasn't doing a manual job. Yeah. Imagine doing a manual job and then having to go to training as well, like. I mean, how you how you cope with that? Like, I, I mean, I was tired enough having done like a full day, like maybe not as physically tired as these guys would be, but mentally exhausted. Um, when your days are starting at eight, and you know you're not getting back in for training till ten o'clock. But players, part time players, do that. Um, yeah. I think uh, it was always difficult for me, especially at teams where I wasn't training every day. Like, if they were full time and I was part time. That was always a bit difficult. It was easier at Livingston because I already had a bit of respect and, you know, um, guys knew what I could do and uh, I, I would do what was expected of me. But at Falkirk, try to force your way into a team was pretty much yeah. impossible um, to, to do that. And uh, when I went full-time, I was aware of the fact that I needed to protect my career when I think because football was, I was only thinking I was going to do two years of full time football when I went to Gretna I was like I'll go to uni well I'll do a postgraduate uh, diploma in sports and exercise medicine and I'll work half a day a week so when I agreed to the contract I'm saying look uh, I know you're normally off on a Wednesday but you can't say to me um, we're in this Wednesday because I'm working I'm, I've got another job on a Wednesday so there was occasional times when there was a wee rift because mm-hmm. it said all oh, we're training on Wednesday this week because I don't know it was a, a we had a midweek game or what, the, 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 the schedule was changed it was rare I'm like well I'm working I'm, I, I can't come here you knew that already but it was still like this frostiness like about um, that I was being treated differently and I was like but that me I shouldn't have been having to worry about that because that, that was what I agreed when I signed the, the contract now when I went to St Johnston and I was playing in the Premier League I basically said right, I'll sign I need a, a, on a Monday I'm going to be working in the afternoon I need to be away for training at 12 o'clock so I can still come to training on a Monday, but I need to be away for 12 o'clock. And I didn't want to be the person on the pitch because if I was on the pitch and training on a Monday and going, what time is it? Is it time for me to go yet? And it, like I wouldn't wear a watch. I would want to concentrate on my job when I was there, but I, I was trusting them to say, right, Kenny, that's time for you to, you to go. But that never happened. So I ended up like we would be training be training at like uh, is it 
Kilgraston School. It was a mm-hmm. private school up in kind of Perthshire. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you get changed at McDermott Park, train at Kilgraston, and then you'd have to go back to get changed, showered, and then go. But my job was in Wisher, so and, and I needed to be there for half past one. So basically Jeez. what was happening was basically what was happening was I was training at Kilgraston and I would like be manky. I'd jump in the car at Kilgraston and drive to the hospital in my uh, my kit. I'd be filthy most of the time. I'd get to the uh, the hospital at Wishaw with about fifteen minutes, sometimes, sometimes less, to go until the start of my shift. I'd be like, right, the mud's dry now because I've been driving for over an hour. I would pull my trousers and that on over my manky body. I'd go in in the day of the clinic, absolutely clarty oh. underneath my face. <laughs> so, like, it was just, uh, and and I, I actually, when after that season, I was thinking I needed to do a wee bit more. And St Johnston had offered me a two-year contract, so I could have been at St Johnston uh, the two years that you know that I was at kind of Falkirk, Levy, uh, Stenish Muir. Felt as if I needed to go back to medicine at that point, and I did have brief discussions with them about, you know, I could play part time with St Johnston. But given the experience that I'd had with no getting away from work and how that might look if I was late for work all the time and mm-hmm. stuff, I just thought, you know, I need to just go into a fresh place, which was Falkirk, and like lay down what the criteria was for me going there. Right, I'm. I, uh, I can if I need to go away I need to go away that's the, the, I'm, I'm going uh, I didn't want it, it to uh, affect my career and like the way I was perceived uh, within my profession it was going to um, be important for me for the rest of my life So um, can you tell us your your fives team and who and why okay, Well I'm glad I'm glad you gave me a bit of warning Luckily, I was only there for a year, so there wasn't actually a huge many to uh, uh, choose from. But I've actually, I've actually got six names. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure who I would uh, who I would take out, take out. But I'm I'm definitely going with the old like fives uh, uh, with your mates, a goalkeeper. I don't know why I go and goals. So you've got to take your turn. You have to go in goals for one. So I've no choice. I'm sticking okay. with five outfield players, and we're just all going to have to take their turn to go in goals at some point. Uh-huh. So, um, so I'm definitely choosing Robbie Winters uh, because when I was wee, I was a Dundee United supporter. And he was like one of my heroes, and one of the best things about being a professional football player for me was that I got to rub shoulders with folk that like I was like thought were amazing like were my idols Gary Bowling was one of them never, <laughs> never felt on that to his face but he was like he was a he was like first team at Dundee United I was I was gutted when he went to Rangers Bobby Winters I got to play with Alan Main. No, I'm, I'm going off topic a wee bit for my five-a-side team, but Alan Main was the goalkeeper in the uh, cup final at Hamden when it was Dundee United, Motherwell, and I was there as like a 10, 11-year-old, like supporting Dundee United, all right, we got beat, but then like 15 years later, I played in a Scottish Cup final way Alan Main and goals for my team. That's Actually, incredible when I think back to like, being a kid there and watching these guys, same way John O'Neill. John O'Neill was a like a, a cracking player for Dundee United, and he played with us at Gretna. Uh, I got to play once against Christian Daly. He was like he was a he was at Rangers, and uh, I was back from America. And David Adams was the manager at Morton, and he let me play in like a closed doors game for uh, for Morton against Rangers at uh, Murray Park. I was playing against Christian Daly and I was like, oh my God, this is like the best. <laughs> like, I've had no, like, I've played professional for a, a few years, but then but I was like, oh my God, this guy is like amazing. I was like a bit in awe of Christian Daly. 
<laughs> and after the game, Christian Daly came over me and he tapped me on the shoulder and he was like, hey, Kenny, what? and I was like, oh my God. Like, I don't know what they say. And he was asking me, he was asking me about America and like what it was like and, uh, and if it was a good, like, I don't know if he was thinking about maybe like going and playing over there. And I was just like, this is actually like incredible that this guy is like asking for my opinion on something. Anyway, so Robbie Winters, but I mean, partly because he was like a Dundee United player and he was one of my heroes when I was growing up, but like there was there would be nobody better at fives, uh, anybody in my team with a ball. You just you, you can't get the ball off him. His touch so good, like uh, left foot, right foot, like just great. It would definitely be a brilliant fives player. Um. I've got I've got Keegan Jacobs. Um, nice. I mean, he's obviously a Livy legend, um, and uh, I mean, he is just his work rate was like incredible. You just, he, he, he just, it was you could never count him out of anything. Mm-hmm. Like he, a lot, of, you were like the only reason he's managed to do that is because of his work rate and his effort. Like, um, he's got quality, but like it, it, his work rate and effort was just like he's the type of guy you want to be playing alongside. Eh? Mm-hmm. Um, he's been a great servant to the club. Obviously, he's been at third division and uh, all the way up to the, the the Premier League and that. So, I went pretty attacking to be honest. That's maybe my bi- my my bias stuff. I've, I've definitely got Sparky, Mark McNulty, and as well. Mm-hmm. Like he kind of. Uh, enjoyed watching him like, go up the levels and playing for Scotland and that and like remembering that basically when he broke into the team he would be playing with me like a lot and it's great kudos to say to my wee boys and like see uh, see uh, Mark McNulty he he, um, he was my strike partner at, at Livy and they're like oh my god because like they've got they've never seen me play football I was too old by that time like like they can't even remember anything and they're like I, th- I still think that my kids didn't really believe me <laughs> what are you playing the same team as Mark McNulty and I'm like aye <laughs> taught him everything he knows to <laughs> I'm on David Beckham he only managed one hat trick for Livy, so I definitely have him because he's probably played at the highest level of anybody that was at Livy at the time. Uh, Stefan Scoogle played for Sheffield United, obviously, and I think played in a uh, played in the FA Cup semi final. But I've actually not got him in my team because <laughs> he didn't. He was he didn't really. I didn't feel I could put him in because he didn't really break into the team until kind of the last. Few months of my time there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I put Ian Russell in as well because I, I, I think I mentioned earlier that, like, with the energy he brought when he came onto the pitch, like he was a he was a pest in the way that I couldn't be a pest, and I was a pest in the way that he couldn't be a pest. So it worked, <laughs> it worked pretty well, um, and obviously, like, um, Banner's tremendous. So. He's in for the banner in the dressing room as well. <laughs> uh, and the the last two that I couldn't really decide, I couldn't really decide between. Now I've, I've got Kyle Jacobs and uh, Rafa Devita. Um, I wasn't sure if I would need like the workman like guy in the middle of a uh, fives team to do the dirty work. And Kyle would do that, but he's still got the quality and work rate. Or just like Rafa De Vita was just sometimes a joy to watch, really. Like, um, touch and uh, he was deceptively quick as well. Um, just a really clever, clever player. Like, I, I, would, I would get the ball and I would pass it to him in trouble. A confidence... <laughs> that he would get out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a, a quick couple of things. Liam Liam knows what one of them is. Uh, I've been waiting for this for a very, very, very long time. So I was sitting at work on that Tuesday morning that uh, it was announced that you'd signed for us. So I was like, right, 
I've got the I've got the night off. I can uh, I can go to the game. Uh, so I text Liam and I said, Liam, how do you fancy going to see the East Fife Levy game? And he goes, ah, I'm not really that interested. I was like, Come on, Kenny Duker's just signed for us, man. No, Kenny Duker's shite. I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> No, I really it. wish that I'd actually kept the text to be able to show you now. But, uh, that is like, word you know, word exactly what he said. What well, what I will say, right? He's not the first person that said that, and he'll not be the last. <laughs> to be fair, not not right. I changed my mind instantly because that night when I looked at the score and I seen, like, I can't even remember what the score was, but I seen that you scored the hat trick, and I immediately started the King Kenny Duker Facebook page. Which I think, <laughs> which I think you were actually a member of at one point. <laughs> Mate, Liam, I'm I'm a GP trainer, and it's uh, we we try to teach our uh, trainees. It's all about you know realizing when you've made a mistake and being able to reflect and improve nice. yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I done instantly. 96, 90 minutes. I was like, nah, right, I've, I'm wrong here. Kenny Duker's the man. And so I've been trying to prove people wrong my whole life. I've got one more thing. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, go for it. I want to pimp myself out here, right? Me and when the lockdown is finished, me and my father in law are looking for games of golf. So, any Livy fans are golfers, right? And are prepared to like, play around with me and my father in law, sign me on it. Uh, their uh, course or whatever. Man. Wait, I'm uh, shy at golf, but I'll definitely. I'm going to start learning. Do, I'll have golf. a day out. Like, I'm, if you didn't play golf, you can come and caddy. I'll be your caddy <laughs> after I called you shite and you scored the hat trick on your debut. Aye. <laughs> I'm going to put an extra few clubs in the bag for you. A <laughs> <laughs> couple of lead weights or something. A couple of dumbbells stuffed at the bottom. <laughs> if anybody is interested that's listening to this that does play. Um, and they just want to uh, like stalk me on Facebook like what Liam did and just send me a message. Uh, <laughs> that's not all. Thank you, thank uh, you again, Jenny. That's awesome. awesome. So good. Cheers. Catch you later. All the best. Cheers. 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 Monday, the 8th of March, 2021, was International Women's Day, a day to celebrate all the strong women of the world and show them the recognition they deserve each and every day and not just one day of the year. But here, when's International Man's Day, eh? <laughs> It's been every day from the beginning of time, you absolute fucking cretin, away in Heather Wall. To recognise IWD, yeah, that's right, I shortened it. We thought it was about time that we discussed Livingston's women's team, and who better to do it than a white, privileged male? But hold on, don't be too hasty. Thomas is not only romantically involved with one of the Lionesses' star players, he's also their matchday cameraman, and not in a creepy way. So Thomas, take the floor and take us on the journey that brought the women's football team to the Mac Arena. So, way back in December 2019, one before COVID, and we never even thought about finishing top six again or anything like that, Blackburn lead United ladies... And Livingston created a partnership of sorts uh, between the women's sides that meant Livingston, who were the last premiership team, believe it or not, not to have a women's setup, were at last represented in the SWF. So the majority of the squad and coaching staff were retained during the move to Livingston. But in that time, you know, the, the star power of Livingston also brought in some excellent additions around the club in both players and coaches as well. So, a bit more background, the, the club currently plays in the third tier of the game in the Championship South, but they've got ambitions to push forward in game promotion to the SWF PL2 when the season commences. I spoke yesterday to the manager, Paul Giaconelli, who told me how brilliant Livingston had been uh, ever since day one. Uh, they're very welcome and very, very supportive and, and really into the idea of Livingston having a, a team in the Women's League. Um Paul also told me how influential David, influential David Martindale has been in bringing the team to Livingston, and he couldn't speak highly enough of Davy and, and his role uh, in that decision. So, going back a little bit, at the start of the season, they'd made a very positive start. Um, they won two out of their first three competitive games, 
They beat Falkirk in the Championship Cup away from home before the season was unfortunately suspended due to COVID. Back in October, the club also announced a women's under-19 performance league team for the upcoming season, strengthening the pathway for young players to continue to the first team squad. And it gives that kind of sense of uh, belonging to a lot of the younger players around West Lothian who now see they've got a path to play for the, the, the Lothian's premier women's team. Even with the news this week of the top two levels of Scottish women's football commencing again, the club still do not have a definitive roadmap back to training and playing games, but it's positive news regardless. We look forward to seeing them kick on to a promotion up the leagues once the rules allow. Very informative of you there, Thomas. Uh, in terms of when the season gets back up and running, who should we look out for? Who do you think will be the star players to get Livingston up to where they belong in the women's game? So it's it's been a while since I've I've kind of been at the games. So you know to name a few, you know obviously I need to mention mention Rebecca. Um, she's she's great been player. Blackburn. Great player. Great player. Better uh, than you. No, better than you. Uh, oh, definitely better than me. Definitely better than me. But she, you know, she's been with Blackburn and now Livingston for a long time, and um, you know constantly played under kind of each of the coaches even before her dad was in charge. Um, played a lot of games. She's a, a great footballer, makes the team tick, and you know, always good to watch. Like when, when she scored her first goal for Livingston against Falkirk, bit of a, a screamer for her outside the box, you know, proudest, you know, moment ever. It was so good. So good. Yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty class. Um, you know, other other names, uh again, one from back in the Blackburn days who'd moved on, uh, Natasha Fru. Excellent, excellent player, you know. Was key in Blackburn's League Cup success a few years ago. And it's a real good addition to that Livingston side for her to come back um, after she moved on. and But to come back to Livingston, and she'll really, really strengthen the squad. Um, you know, the, 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 there's so many others um, that to mention. Shannon Mulligan in the midfield. Unbelievable player power, strength, gets the team up the park and brings other players into the game. Uh, Vicky Wood as well. She's been, again, with Blab on a long time and has scored countless goals that I've seen breaking in behind, putting the ball into the net. It's it's always great to see. And club captain as well. So they're, they're all fantastic. They play unbelievable football at times. And, you know, a lot of credit goes to Paul. I'm not just saying that because he's my, my father-in-law. Um, but they've got a really good setup. They play. They play really excellent football, much better than the men's team at the moment, to be honest. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I'm just really looking forward to seeing them play again because it's it's always a good watch. And you know, hopefully they can kick on and get what they deserve and get up into that SWPFL Premier League. One thing I will say, I will openly admit that you know I was sort of one of these plastic fans that as soon as it was announced I was like, I'll be there every week, I'll be there and I've been ignorant and not been So, but what I will say is upon the return of the women's team's games, we will be dedicating time each week to the podcast to reviewing their matches the same we do for the men's team uh, we'll also be bringing you interviews as and when we can with management and the players Mona Lionesses Well that was another emotional roller coaster. am I right? Be sure to follow us on the socials, Facebook and YouTube. Just search for the Almond View podcast and our Instagram and Twitter is just at Almond View pod, all one word. And just one last thing, be sure to check our previous episodes out on all good podcast streaming services and make sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Forza Livy, hope to see you next week.